Good afternoon, and uh, yeah, thanks for coming along today. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk on Wilford, not so much touching on miners, um, potentially some of my, my clients. Um, I've obviously got a Suffolk stud and all of my sheep are looked after very well because I don't have a lot. Um, so it's a bit different than in a commercial situation and, and I can appreciate that. But what do your welfare practices say about your business? And I guess that's my challenge to, to you guys is if, if you were an outsider looking in on your business, what would you really think of your welfare? and how you're treating your stock. This year here was down at Dublin. She made you $70, but what did it cost the industry? And that's what I'm seeing getting out and about. The wrong, this picture gets into the wrong hands and it does millions of dollars of damage to our industry. So sure, you made 70 bucks on that you, but you've done a lot of damage to the industry. And we really need to focus um, as a, a whole body on the welfare of our livestock and how uh, we're going to be re representing ourselves globally. So if you don't want to talk about it, then you probably shouldn't be doing it. That's my concept. If you're not happy to talk to a city slicker about how you treat your stock, you're probably doing something wrong. Or you need to have a very good reason as to, to why you're doing that procedure. So this is my rams um, <clears throat> about a week after shearing. So if anyone that thinks the stock don't like shelter, um, it'll prove you wrong. As soon as it starts raining, they'll run to the shed. So. And I've noticed uh, about three years ago, I shear them in, in July for a September sale. Um, and they lost about 10 kilos when they weren't in a paddock with really good shelter. And now that I've put a shelter shed up for them, because I have to shear them then so they're ready on time for the sale, um, they'll sit in that shed every night, whenever it rains, windy, whatever and they don't lose any condition. So I'm just going to do some snapshots on three different producers that I've spent time with. So this is uh, Mumblebone Merinos up in central New South Wales in a 600 mil rainfall. They've got a merino stud um, and a commercial flock as well. So their top tips for the welfare in their system was uh, low stress stock handling schools. So uh, we're going to be hearing a bit more about that later. But that was one of his key points as to how it changes the way he handles his stock. Um, they imprint their wieners. I don't, you can hear about more about that later. Yes? Yep. So, um, yeah, they imprint all of their wieners and they said it's, it's made moving stock from two men, a lot of stress, heap of dogs, sheep going everywhere, into a um, one-man job and a, a very simple task. Um, also, yarding ewes and lambs is now a simple task. He said sometimes they'd end up just letting the sheep go and coming back tomorrow because sheep ended up going everywhere, lambs splitting up and all the rest. Pregnancy testing. So uh, they preg test to use so for managing feeding for the twin bearers versus the singles and the twin bearing mobs are lambed in mobs of 100 ewes or less. Of all the management changes that they've made over the last 10 years, the most significant improvement has been to their lambing rates. Pre-preg testing, scanning and good year, they used to mark 105% and now they're consistently marking 130. And that's all to do with the way that they're managing their stock. They'll admit that some has been through the genetic gain of muscle and fat. So there's a strong correlation in between the fat and the muscle of your sheep to lamb survival. I think an extra half a fat score equals 10 or 15% in lamb survival. So it's very highly correlated to if you can get that condition genetically on your sheep and keep it on them, that they will um, keep more of those lambs alive. Their other big thing was they ceased mulesing in 2006. And I know there's going to be lots of different opinions on mulesing, but for these guys, they found they improved their lamb survival They've improved the early growth, the growth rates because the lambs aren't getting that two-week setback after mealsing. They've reduced labour inputs um, at marking time um, and they are currently using yeah, a pain relief as well at tailing time. And for them, it's a big thing um, that they're meeting their consumers' demands. And more and more, we're seeing that consumers want to know how their product's being produced. And so that um, by non-mealsing, they're, they're meeting that that market as well. So it's been a very simple step for them and it's one that they would like to see the whole industry address, not only for their customers' requests but also to improve the, uh, the performance of their own livestock. 
So approximately 10.5 million lambs die each year during or soon after birth. That's over a billion dollars. Now some of those lambs we can't save and we all know that you're going to get a certain percentage of loss. But this is where most of, you know, you could drop that a huge amount. If you could drop it, you know, even to half, you'd be saving, you'd be making an extra $500 million in the industry. So I think this is what we need to work, about, work on. And this is what welfare groups are only starting to pick up on. So if we can get ahead of the gun and start fixing that problem before they pick up on it, then we are ahead of the game. So these guys are another, these are clients of mine over in Nangan, New South Wales. And they chase muscle and fat in their livestock. That's one of their key drivers. They're a stud and commercial sheep enterprise, 6,800 hectares of native and salt bush pastures, average rainfall 400 mil, uh, 1,000 stud ewes and 1,500 commercial sheep. Their sheep are wrinkle free and are not milled since 2005. So they've been genetically selecting for this for the last, I don't know, 10 or 15 years, I guess. Fertility and growth rates have improved markedly with weaning rates now 130% and ewe lambs joined at seven months in a normal season. So in this last year, obviously, they didn't mate their ewe lambs, but in a normal year, they'll be mating ewe lambs at seven months. The sheep are shorn twice a year, they don't crutch, and they produce six kilos annually over their two shearings. So one of the ways that they are increasing uh, the lamb survival rates is by putting more protection in. So they were saying that often out there, especially in a tough year, the usual lamb, they'll have, even if they have twins, and then they'll just get up and walk away. So they've been planting blocks of salt bush around their watering points, and they save those areas for lambing. The ewes are lambed down in single or twin mobs. So they'll be locked on that, I can't go back, but they'll be locked on that salt bush over that, that lambing period. And they said they'll go out there and, and check them from a distance. And those ewes will be staying with their lambs for the first 24 hours. They'll stay within 50 metres of where they lamb. So for them, they said they're saving a huge amount of lambs. Um, and we're talking out in the you know, station country here. So they're using genetics. Um, the majority of their animals are in the top 5% for muscle and for fat. Their post-weaning muscle and fat measurements um, means the increase in lamb conception and survival, especially through tough climatic conditions. So in years like the last year, um, it's even more important that your sheep are genetically able to thrive in those tougher conditions. Um, it also means a better resilience to internal parasites, so your worms, um, and in obviously increased growth and meat yields means you can turn your lambs off, you're getting better quality carcass. You probably can't really see that a whole lot, but um, that's a, a sheep that they've done up of their lambing percentages over the last um, seven years. So they do, um, you obviously you use joined, uh, your, your conception uh, percentages, um, they do twin and singles, so they know how many fetuses in there and then how many lambs they're weaning out of those ewes. Um, and down the bottom is obviously your rainfall. And probably most markably is in 2017, even though they only had 310 mil of rain, they still <coughs> managed to wean 85% um, of lambs that were fetuses. So 85% of the, the fetuses were weaned. Martindale Farms over here at Mintero. So most of you should know Martindale Farms, I think. 5,000 acres of cropping, um, hay and sheep. They're running 1,600 leech and bloodline merinos and 500 first cross ewes. And their aim is to produce a 60 to 70 kilo ewe that is highly fertile and cuts a minimum of 70 mil every six months. Their welfare things, I guess, is um, they only walk stock, so they'll never run them. Uh, they use their dogs, but a minimal amount. They don't use motorbikes because they feel that often motorbikes mean the sheep get more stirred up or you get into them a bit more, um, so you'll move them faster. They're 100% non-mills flock as of last year, I think it was, or early this year. And last year they got a $2.80 premium for their wool. They use various supplements throughout the year. And one of their, their key drivers is that they maintain good 
body condition all year round and they're maintaining all ewes in a minimum of three score. So quite fat, a lot of their sheep will be four score. Um, but for them it's meaning that they're getting those high lambing rates. So this was their preg testing rates at a five week mating in mid-December and they do a preg test in early March and then they rejoin the dryers for another five weeks, I think it is. Um, so the crossbreds, obviously, they've got a conception rate of 160 or a fetus rate of 162%, um, but even their merino lines are, um, got a fetus rate of 157%. So that's um, fairly outstanding, I think. So the 2018, um, at weaning time, the first cross multiples weaned 160%. The singles weaned 96% and the merino ewes, the singles did just over 100 and the multiples did 136%. So their key to their lamb survival is having plenty of shelter at lambing time. Um, and if necessary, they'll put straw bales in a horseshoe shape or something to give extra shelter. They split twin, twinning ewes up into mobs of 100 to 150, single lambs in mobs of 250 they set stock graze during lambing so they don't have to be moving their sheep. Um, if, the, if the paddock does run out of feed, then they'll open the, pad, uh, the gate into the neighbouring paddock so the sheep can slowly drift out with their lambs. They'll check lambs from the ewes with binoculars and if they need to um, intervene, they will, but most of the time they don't have to. Um, and the odd ewe or lamb unit ends up in the shed for whatever reason. So their key is to keep ewes in condition score three to three and a half. They always use lick feeders during lambing to give the ewes extra energy. And then they wean their lambs at approximately 12 weeks of age. So just finishing off, I'm nearly done, but um, I don't know, has many of you guys heard of responsible wool standards? No, yes, no. So it's big in um, New Zealand, in fact, it's huge in New Zealand, it's about five or six um, farmers in Australia that were using it as about four months ago. Um, do we really need a global standard? Some would argue that we don't, but the, ex the textile exchange was a clear message from the large number of brands that we do, and that the customer wants to know how their product is being produced. So this is what it is. It's basically, it's a guide that you'll tick off on, um, and it crosses all the management of your livestock. So it'll be, you know, the process that goes through at shearing time, marking time, shelter in paddocks, how they're transported. Um, and it's really just guaranteeing to our um, customers that what we are doing is good and that we are looking after the welfare of um, our stock. So switching over to the, the pig industry, I was working there when I think it's, they started banning set house stalls and they said that by 2017 that they would ban all sow stalls. When the ban was getting talked about, all the producers got upset. They said that there was going to be, you know, a heap of extra, um, you know, the, the sows will get savage and beat each other up and losses in pregnancies and they reckoned it would cause huge issues to their industry. But collectively, they got on board and they, um, they researched into what was the best way of group housing sows. Um, and they decided that they would phase out sow stalls two years earlier than required. Now, 95% of piggeries said they would never use sow stalls again, and they said the benefits of not using it was huge and far outweighed the odd mishap you had, um, like now the uh, group housing sows. So I guess my challenge to you guys is that rather than resisting, should we be more proactive in meeting our customers' demands, and rather than just trying to, you know, I guess keep the, the hat on whatever's going on and, and make, we, we really need to get out there and be proud of what we do, um, do the best we can. And if, if our customers are requiring something, then we either need to change or we need to have an adequate reason why that process needs to happen.